let's go to the word amen hallelujah i saw a really unique uh, uh uh text the other day and it said let's all pretend it's easter and go back to church this week so some of you did that amen amen you know we have a full house on easter we had almost well we had over 1200 come last week to easter which is uh which is good we've had that for several years now and uh, i'm excited about that but i'm also you know i was talking to some of other churches you know we're a family of churches and uh, lakeland just had a numbers of people and several of our other churches and brother jeff in winter haven had 1800 at his service and then the churches were at capacity all over and our churches are just growing and there's the significance of our church we have a, 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 a something about us that's different and i'm just proud that you're part of i'm glad you're part of our church and it's a wonderful place that we have the word of god we teach faith here and so uh, we're not going to just, you know, leave you hanging. You know, interestingly enough, my wife and I, you know, uh, we've never been messed up. <laughs> I see all these messages out there about everybody's got to be messed up and God got y'all messed up and, and they, you know, and everybody's shouting because they were messed up. And I want a church where we don't have to all be messed up. I want to teach people how not to be messed up. I want to teach you how to fit instead of be a misfit. You know, my wife never, I was the first guy she ever kissed. Yeah, and what's that tell you how good a man I am, right? <laughs> Look at this, a hunk of hunk of right here. <laughs> but I, I mean, she didn't go around sleeping with everybody. She didn't go around having, you know, relationships with the world. And she didn't run around with, you know, half of her body showing. You would look at my wife. My wife's very modest. We're teaching our kids that. They don't have to be all messed up. They don't have to be degenerates, fouled up drug addicts. Now, I'm glad if that's where you were and you got saved because God delivers us from those things. But if you've gotten saved, it's time for you not to be a misfit anymore. Somebody say amen. You've been bought, bought with a price. You're part of the family. And we preach messages all the time. All these places preach messages and, and tell everybody that, you know, I mean, everybody's in the same boat. And I'm not in your boat. I've never been a drug addict. I've never had a bunch of drugs. I've never done drugs. I've never had a drug in my life. The only drug I take is a blood pressure pill. I, I, for 20-something for, for years of my life, I didn't even take an aspirin. I, I just wouldn't even take an aspirin. I mean, I just didn't do it. And then some of my friends in Bible school talked me into it. <laughs> Amen. But, I mean, I didn't even know what that was. I've never smoked a cigarette. Never. Not in my lifetime. I've never had a beer, not in my lifetime, never. And let me tell you something, kids, moms and dads, you can believe, God, that your children don't have to do those things. They don't have to be messed up. You know, the greatest testimony is not that you were a degenerate in cri a criminal, you know, that you were a, a fouled up person and that God got you out. That's a good testimony. But an even better testimony is you lived a holy life. Somebody ought to say Amen. We're believing God for the people in this church. And we're believing God for the children in this church. You moms and dads that have little babies and I see them in the room. You ought to be in this place where we're going to teach you how to raise your kids. Where they can get a good education. They do well in school. Where they have success. Somebody say amen. The blessings of the Lord make rich and add no sorrow thereto. Amen. We're not believing for them to be all fouled up. Come on. You know what you preach is what you're going to get. You know, if you sell everybody on the idea it's okay to be a messed up person and that God bails you out, then everybody that comes in thinks it's okay to be a messed up person. But it's not okay to be a messed up person. God wants to deliver us from messed up. Come on, somebody. I don't know what, what your experiences were, but I know this. God wants to make them good experiences. God wants to make sure that you have life and have life more abundantly. Look at somebody and say, God wants you to have a good life. I know some of you in the room might say, well, I grew up and didn't have anything. We ate ramen noodles. That's all we had, Pastor Steve. And, 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 and I'm a success because of the challenges I went through. All that made me a stronger person. But the Bible doesn't say that your experiences make you stronger. It says that the Word makes you stronger. How many know that if the Word of God gets on the inside of you, your experiences will demonstrate the Word of God? You'll look like the Word. The Word has signs following. Somebody say amen. amen. we got to be careful. 
Because we have churches filled with people that just live these lives and they just keep living this stuff because we preach to them that, that that's somehow God's benefit to their life. That somehow they're, that, that they're really godly people. The more messed up they are and the more they've gone through, well, God's just making them stronger. God's just bringing them higher. God's just increasing your faith. Your faith does not increase by your experiences. Nowhere in the Word of God does faith come by experience. Your experiences do not generate faith in you. The horrible things you go through don't make you better. The Word. He said we're washed by the water of the Word. Somebody say amen. Amen. How does faith come? The Bible says faith cometh by hearing. Somebody say faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the Word of God. So what you go through doesn't make you stronger. It, in the natural sense of things, I'm certain that there are, are things that build character in people. And so from that point of view, sure. But in spiritual terms, there are spiritual things. And we need to define the difference between the natural and the spirit. And if we're so constantly caught up in a natural mentality and a natural experience and natural things somehow being the thing, the Bible doesn't say that he teaches us through natural experience. It says that by he, he, his spirit, bearing witness with our spirit, we are the sons of God. You shouldn't take pleasure and pride in the negative things that go on in your life as if it's some kind of honorable badge that you've been such, in, in such terrible things. Look how good God is. No, terrible things come from the devil. You know, it's a shame I have to say this every week, but I get so many people, we get all inundated with radio programs and TV preachers and all this stuff and the big superstars, and they tell us, you know, as ba- b- bad things make you better. That's not what the Word says. From glory to glory, He changes us. Listen, we're supposed to be fighting the good fight of faith. Look at somebody and say, fight the good fight, fight the good of, faith. Good. of faith. What is a good fight? One you win. That's right. We win. We are winners. This is the victory. This is the thing that overcomes the world. It's our faith. We're supposed to overcome the world. Yes, we're in the world. Yes, we have challenges. Yes, we have issues and situations. But we're to overcome them. And when we come out, we're supposed to come out looking like God says. He said that we're supposed to be blessed from the top of our head to the soles of our feet. Blessed in the city. Blessed in the field. Blessed coming in. Blessed going out. We are the head and not the tail. We are over and not under. And i got to keep saying this to you because the devil's bad and God is good. I wish you'd shout that out. God good. The devil's bad. I never fail at this funeral yesterday. And at every funeral I preach, I take one moment to assess blame. One moment to say where it came from. We lost a, great, uh, a good man. We lost a great uh, 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 person and her husband. And he, he died to a disease, a terrible disease. And I was able to say yesterday, John 10.10 10 tells us that the thief. See, everybody in this room ought to be able to say it. The thief comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. The thief is the one. The thief is the one. Where did cancer come from? Well, obviously, the sin of Adam at the beginning brought in these kinds of things. Sin brings death, and it brought sickness and disease, but it came from the devil's deception. Ultimately, if we put it back to the death, it's the devil. The devil's the one. The Bible says Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Acts 10, 38 says he went about doing good, healing all those who were sick and oppressed of the devil. The devil's the one who makes sick. The devil's the one who oppresses. But the rest of that verse says this, but Jesus came. That ought to be a shouting time right there. I feel like running the building every time I preach this. Every time I say it, it makes me want to leap. It makes me want to jump. I want to flip and turn circles because I know that the God that I serve is a good God. He's never bad. He's never been bad. He's never going to be bad. He doesn't put bad things on people. He doesn't destroy people. He doesn't 
tear people down. He doesn't ruin lives and wreck hopes. He brings peace and safety. He brings kindness and gentleness. He brings the fruits of the Spirit into our life. And the Lord is good and His mercies endure forever. For the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. Jesus came that I might have life and that I might have life more glory to God. Glory to God. I wish somebody would shout amen. amen. And I might have life and have life more abundantly. I don't have to be strung out on drugs. I don't have to try. See, I've never had alcohol. Not even interested. Don't know what a buzz is. Not ever going to have a buzz. All I know is how to be filled with the Holy Ghost. He said, be not drunk with wine, where is in excess, but be being filled with the Holy Ghost. I don't have to get drunk. I don't have to get a buzz. I don't have to drink wine at the table. I'm not condemning anybody that did. Now, some of y'all might get mad at me. But if you were like me, and you decided just instead of having a sip of wine at the table, you decided to just spend a few minutes in, oh, when I pray over my food, I mean it. Amen. I want God to come bless it. Amen. Bless me. And I just get so tanked up on God, and I can get it anywhere. I don't have to have a buzz. Amen. Somebody ought to shout out amen right there. Amen. Just get turned on for God. Amen. Substitute God for the other. Put God in his proper place. Fill yourself up with God. When you get that hankering to go smoke a cigarette, somebody said, what? Wait, wait, where's he going? Like I said, I'm not the judge. I'm not the jury. I'm not telling you that I can sit here and determine who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. None of us can. But I know what the package says. It tells me if you're a smoker, you're going early. Somebody ought to say amen. Right. amen. And you may go in a mess. Right. I've sat in rooms where people were sitting there on oxygen machines and <laughs> for the last two years of their life. <laughs> I don't know about the way else. I'm not going that way. I'm not going out that way. Somebody ought to shout out amen. I'm going in my right mind because God gave me a spirit of love, power, and of a sound mind. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm not going out with debilitating diseases, can't walk, all messed up, no brain. Somebody shout out amen. amen. Come on. We don't have to go that way because God is a good God. Amen. And he loves us with an everlasting love. He fills us with his goodness. He said, great are his benefits. He daily loadeth us up with benefits. Somebody look at somebody and say, there's a lot of benefits to serving God. Serve him. Serve him. Serve him. Reap the benefits of your salvation. And today I want to talk about kingdom stewardship. There are several aspects to kingdom stewardship. And many times I've talked about key, kingdom stewardship, and, and when you hear that word, you immediately start thinking of financial stewardship. Many of you think I'm going to talk on financial stewardship. I'm not. That's only one aspect of kingdom stewardship. There's also physical stewardship. We have a, 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 a 24 hours in a day. We sell eight of those, most of us, to somebody at a job. And that still leaves additional hours to watch television, to go to this ball field, to eat, to sleep. And there's a portion of that that God wants us to give to him. There's physical stewardship. Many people, see, if you don't understand, there's more forms to kingdom stewardship than just some. I've had people in the church over the years, many years have gone by, and I've had people at the church, and as I've had them in the church, some of them thought all they had to do was bring tithe. And they would come and they would bring their tithe into the storehouse, but we couldn't get them to do anything. We couldn't get them to serve in a nursery, sing in the choir, play an instrument. We couldn't get them to, 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 to faithfully be to more than one service a week or even one service a month. 
You say, people come to the church one service a month and pay tithes? Sure, because they got that principle. They realized that that principle would work in their life. And so they understood, if I give my seed, that God's going to multiply my seed that I sow, and it's going to come back to me. If I cast my bread on the water, it's going to come back on every shore. And they got a revelation of God's word and God's will in the area of finances. And they may, may not even, nowadays you don't even have to darken the doors of a church to tithe. They go to the website and they'll tithe faithfully. Our finances are just as good as they've ever been or better. We've had one of the greatest uh, first quarters of the year we've ever had as a church. It's amazing what God is doing. It's just tremendous. The number of growth. How many? We called literally dozens and dozens of new families. And we had uh, 36 or 37 give the heart to Jesus last week. I mean, it's just, just things happening and all. And, but because some people have gotten a hold of a principle in an area and said, yeah, I get it. I'm supposed to bring my tithe. They'll do that, but we don't see them. We don't see them pick up trash in the parking lot. We don't see them straighten up chairs. We don't see them greet at the door. We don't see them park cars. We don't see them pray for the sick. We don't see them help the, uh, the pastor help the people. And be the ministry of helps in the church. So there's a physical stewardship. God wants a portion of your time. He wants a portion of your talent. He wants a portion. And, and, and it's not because he wants it for himself. Do you understand? When you give, the Bible says in Luke chapter 6 verse 30, give and it will be given back to you. Good measure. Press down. Shaken together and running over, God will cause men to pour into your bosom. So God will allow your gift of servitude, your stewardship to be benefited back to you. See, if you want to go in the ministry, the first criteria, the very first thing about being in ministry, if you want to be part of the five-fold ministry, there are people in this room that have a desire and a dream to be part of the five-fold ministry. The, the, the criteria that we should look for is not the talentedness. It is not the, the giftedness. I, I know of, I was talking to a pastor friend of mine the other day. A young musician in our town that's part of a, a ministry here. He's a very talented young man. Very gifted young man. And so I, 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 my pastor friend was in Charlotte at a meeting where this particular individual was playing at the meeting. And so while they were playing at the meeting, they decided, everybody kind of got loose for the meeting in the afternoon, went to the mall. While they were at the mall, my pastor friend saw this gentleman and started to walk over and talk to him, but didn't make it to him while he was talking to some young ladies at a store. And so he got back to back with the young man. And so the young man started cussing every foul word you could imagine, F this, S, H, bleep, bleep, bleep. My pastor friend just walked away. And ask me about it. Do you know this guy? Yeah, I know him. See, you can be gifted and talented. You can be full of giftings and talents. But that doesn't mean you've sown them. That doesn't mean that they were holy. He said, let those that bear the vessels of the Lord be holy. I pray to God that in our church, listen, if I put you on my platform, you better live it. And if you're not, straighten up. Because if I catch you, I'm throwing you off. I'm not going to do it. We're going to talk. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. We're stewards of what God gave us. God expects us to be stewards of the word of God. Stewards of our body. Stewards. And we present these things to God. We present them holy. We present them acceptable. We present them before our Savior. And we're stewards of it. God gifted us with it to be stewards of it. But he didn't do it so that we could have less. He did it so we could have more. When you give your time, when you give your talent, there's a return on your time and your talent. God wants to increase your life. Look at somebody and say, God wants to increase you. So those are two aspects. God wants to increase us financially. So he's given us the ability to do financial stewardship. God wants to increase us socially, mentally. He wants to increase us in our talents, in our time, in our abilities. And he does that through our physical stewardship. But I want to talk to you about the most important one. There's one more stewardship called spiritual stewardship. We are to be spiritual stewards. Look at somebody and say, spiritual stewardship. Spiritual stewardship is the highest 
level. There is no greater level than spiritual stewardship. No greater level. You'll have no greater return on any investment you make in the kingdom of God than spiritual stewardship. There will be no greater return. The highest return you will ever receive in the kingdom of God, the highest benefit that you will ever have is from spiritual stewardship. More will be gained by spiritual stewardship than any other type of stewardship. What is spiritual stewardship? Spiritual stewardship, spiritual stewardship is partnering with Jesus for the expansion, enlargement, and advancement of his kingdom. Amen. 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 Let me say it again. Spiritual stewardship is the partnering with Jesus for the expansion, enlargement, and advancement of the kingdom of God. I'm going to say it one more time. Spiritual stewardship is partnering with Jesus for the expansion, enlargement, and advancement of the kingdom of God, of his kingdom. Soul winning endeavors, both in prayers and reaching out for the lost, are the most important thing you and I can do for our benefit. Amen. Amen. Yes. I need you to get this because if you understand that, think about this. The Bible says in Luke 15, 7, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner. How many? One sinner that repents. Joy shall be in heaven. Nothing puts joy in heaven like winning souls. There's joy in heaven as a soul winner. The celebration that occurs in heaven For one soul that comes to know Christ. And that should tell us, we should understand how important it is and how much value God places on the soul winner. The soul winner. The person that wins souls. You should ask yourself as you're sitting here, how many people, because this is the highest level, not your running, not your jumping, not your flipping, Not all the money you gave will net you the benefit. As a matter of fact, my post today, nothing we do for God reaps greater reward than soul winning. I'd write that down. I'd put that all over the internet. I'd post that today. Nothing we do for God reaps greater rewards than soul winning. God wants us to understand it. Matthew 16, 26 says, what profits a man? That he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul. And what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What could you exchange that equals a man's soul? Not all the money in the world. Not all the wealth in the world. That's what he's saying. What could you exchange that equals the value of a soul? I was privileged. I, I, I'm just, we, we had a wonderful funeral yesterday, and it was just a great time for me to share with the family. But the greatest part of that funeral was that I am absolutely certain, because he was, God gave him a moment. I watched how God gave him a moment to make it right, to settle his affairs and set the record straight and get, get himself positioned for heaven. And he looked at his wife, and he said, I'm ready. I don't, you know, I don't know if anybody understands. I, I don't know, you know, when I get there and I get to that day, I want to be able to say, I'm Amen. ready. Amen. I'm ready. Amen. Today you may be sitting in this room and, and, and there's nothing in this room, there's nothing we could ever give. No amount of money, all the world's money cannot be exchanged for the value of Malachi going to heaven. Amen. Whew. For him saying, I'm ready. That's how valuable you are, but it's also how valuable everyone else is. It's how valuable. For Christ so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. How much value is there in a soul? Ultimate value. That's how much you're worth in this room. If you're sitting here, you don't know Jesus. He loves you that much. You mean that much. And so does everyone else. 
When I think about our church and what our endeavors must be, I am for building buildings. We have to do it because we have to bring people in. But if the building is so we can have just a bigger crowd and a bigger name, then we did the wrong thing. This building must be about souls. Those nurseries must be about souls. The parking lots must be about souls. The youth center must be about souls. The children's rooms must be about souls. The buses must be about souls. Our endeavor must be for souls because nothing means more to God than souls. When you and I come to the house of God, we must realize that it is not just a place where we come and get our amens on. It's not just a place where I get fulfilled in my life for my own health and wealth. It is a place where if I'll sow into the kingdom, the greatest benefits of my life come from that sowing. That I'm part of something building the kingdom of God. See, we've got to switch our mentality from what about me? Come on, somebody. What about me? Why Why does God want to bless you? Well, let's keep going. I know I'm almost done. One soul. That means that all the wealth put together is not worth a soul in the sight of God. That's why God said he would pay anything, give anything, and take anybody to any level who truly loves him and commits to see souls saved. Did you hear what I said? God will pay anything. He will give anything. He will take anything. And he will take anyone to any level who commits to seeing soul saved. How do I know that? Here's what it says. Proverbs 1130. The fruit of righteousness is a tree of life. The fruit of righteousness and he that winneth souls is wise. He that winneth souls is wise. You have to ask yourself, you have to ask yourself, have I won anybody for Jesus? Am I filling the church with people and discipling them? Look through the church today and see how many you brought. How many of them in the room did you bring? How many of them in the room did you disciple and help keep? Look around. Everybody should be looking. You know why you're not looking? Because you know there's nobody in here to look at. I know you want your blessing. I know you want your overcoming life. I know you want your healing. I know you want to be blessed in the city and blessed in the field and blessed coming in and blessed going out. I mean, that's why you came, isn't it? So you could hear the word of God and I could stir your emotions and stimulate you so you could leave and say, Whoa, what a great service. (laughs) But none of that without soul winning will net you a harvest. God's not going to get to heaven. We're not going to get to heaven. And when we get there, God is not going to reward us by how many laps we ran around the building. This is real life right here. This is the real deal. Because all of our efforts must change and switch. How many believe Jesus is coming back? Raise your hands if you believe it. All right, put them down. How many believe he's coming back soon? The harvest truly is plenteous. But the laborers... There's a spiritual stewardship. But look at what he says here. Daniel 12, 3. I just said, he that winneth souls is wise. Daniel 12, 3 says, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Let's tie it together. He that winneth souls is wise. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they shall turn many to righteousness as the stars, as the stars forever and ever. 
Everybody that is committed to turning people to Christ and to righteousness will end up a star. Amen. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. You, want, you want promotion in ministry? You want to be promoted in God? You want to see your business succeed? You want to see God take you to the next level of your life? When you connect with what God is connected with, when you become part to what God, when you partner with God, God partners with you. If you're stagnant in your relationship, you want the best marriage, become a soul winner. You want the best business experience, you want your job to excel, you want promotions, you want to see the blessings of God come in your house, then become a soul winner. Because he said you're going to shine as the brightness of the firmament and you'll be a star. God makes stars out of soul winners. Serving God was Daniel's life. It was his lifestyle. And you see, we still talk about Daniel. There are people today that even though they're dead and buried, they never died. What do I mean? Because they're still speaking. When we're soul winners, think about all the great soul winners in life. We still talk about them. When Billy Graham goes on to be with Jesus, his name will continue. His words will continue. God made him a star. I wish you understood what I'm talking about. Our acceleration in God, our promotion into the things of God, it comes through being a soul winner. Supernatural breakthrough comes through soul winning. Your star keeps rising in God, and there's never going to be a setback. Soul winners can't be set back. Somebody ought to shout out amen. Amen supernatural breakthrough spiritual stewardship is the platform of a rising giant if you want to be a giant in God a giant in business a giant in the things of God a giant in your future then soul winning is the key amen somebody say amen it's the platform commitment to the expansion Commitment to the enlargement and the advancement of God's kingdom is a covenant platform for a rising giant. God will take you to higher places and do more with your life. Everyone that's truly committed to soul winning ends up a giant. Everyone truly committed. See, many of us got saved. And when we got saved, we, we started telling people about Jesus. And we were so excited. If they said, come pick up the trash, we picked up the trash. If somebody told us we could, we could, we could paint a wall, we came and painted a wall. And we told everybody about our church because we knew that's where we got saved or where God was blessing us. We filled the house of God. And then we got, we got mature. I wish somebody knew exactly what I'm talking about. We got mature, and all of a sudden, we lost our zeal for the most important thing that you and I could ever do, and the greatest wealth benefit, the greatest net benefit in our life will always be endeavoring to do what God is doing on this earth, and he that winneth souls. We've got to become soul winners again. The excitement of our church is not how great the music is. That's just a benefit. We're believing God for greater talent. Obviously, we need a piano player at this time. We're believing God for that. We're asking God to send in the right person that can do this job and teach a music school here at Family Worship Center. But I don't come here every day, and I'm not going to be distracted by whether or not we have the greatest piano player sitting on the platform. I didn't. People get saved whether we play a piano or don't play a piano. My excitement for this church is not generated by the awesome worship team. It's by an awesome word that you get here that that sets you straight on a path. There's not a person that comes to Family Worship Center, including some of those who've left. And I'm not saying anything about people who left. But if you look at their life, they ask me, pray for me a job. Pray that God will bless me. I've got no job. I ain't got nothing. And our house is a mess and all this. And we prayed. God gave them jobs. God gave them cars. God blessed them with awesome marriages. God healed them. Then all of a sudden, they're gone. They didn't realize that the seed sown in their life was a message in this church that made an impact in their life. It's not the praise team. We're not following praise teams. We're following Jesus. We're following the word of God. I wish somebody get this message. The real joy of salvation isn't what you get when you come to church. It's who you bring when you come. Let me say that again. The real joy... 
And I know that God, listen, I know if we focus our attentions the right way, Jesus said, if you lift me up, I'll lift all, I'll draw them into myself. If we refocus our attentions and we push ourselves towards souls and seeing people saved and loving on people, and, and when new people come, instead of kicking them out of the field, instead of yelling at them for parking at the wrong place, instead of saying they went to the wrong bathroom when they walk in the door, This has to be a, 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 a soul-friendly church. We've got to be soul-friendly. We've got to invite the world to come into the church. They don't know Jesus. They don't know the lingo. They don't know the jargon. All they know is they need something. And if we come in and show them the love of Jesus, they'll find it in the house of God. Somebody ought to shout amen right there. Amen. Say, good preaching, pastor. Good preaching, pastor. Say it again. Good preaching, pastor. People do come where there's a fire. They come where there's a flame. They come and gather around fires and flames. Every time you see an accident, you'll be stuck in traffic for hours. Everybody's a gawker. Everyone wants to be part of something that's going on. You know, that's what we need to do here. You need to generate a fire on the inside of you and start stirring up something inside this place and say, we're winning souls. That's the most important thing we could do. And you ought to be bringing people in here and everybody ought to be hearing every day about how great what God is doing at your church. You ought to be so zealous about God, so zealous about the things of God. But we've become complacent. 16 years has gone by. And now you're waiting on me to do the stirring. I'm old. <laughs> when I was 30, I could run with the best of them. I was jumping and shouting and building walls and screaming and hollering. And I was doing everything. I mowed the grass, blew off the parking lot, painted the walls, built the walls. I preached, sang. I did it all. I did everything. I'm 48. I ain't doing that. It's time that we, as a mature church, become first love oriented, fall in love with Jesus again, and start going out in the highways and byways. Realize we have a great place to bring souls to, a great place. And I'm not talking about going and trying to steal people from other churches. It makes me sick. I'm so sick of it. I'm so sick of seeing everybody inviting somebody from some other church to come to their church. Listen, if they're hungry, they'll get out of there and find us. We don't have to go pull them out. Go out in the world. I've got, listen, when you walk in the mall, see if you know how many people are in the mall. They don't know them. 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 You go to a restaurant. See how many people you know in the restaurant. There are hundreds of thousands of people in our region that don't go to church anywhere, that don't go to another church, that aren't connected to another ministry. The moment I hear somebody's connected to another ministry, I stop talking. If somebody left our church, they went somewhere else, I'm done. I'm not going after you. You need to connect with your new place. I'm not calling you. I'm not coming after you. And then if I did, if I did call you, I'm going to say, look, if you're connected someplace else, then cut me off right now. I don't want to talk to you unless you're looking. That's just the way I am. That's the way I roll. Come on, somebody. But if every one of us would go out in the highways and byways, because there are people that are dis disconnected. They're not going anywhere. They're not committed anywhere. They're not achieving anything. They're not even saved. Let's go get them. Well, you're not rolling right now. Nobody's flipping today. <laughs> Nobody's flipping today because this is about stewardship. This is about the activity of faith. See, we could pray until the cows come home, but prayer without an act won't do anything. We have to act on our prayer. So Abraham, let's just look at Abraham. Abraham was blessed of God. How blessed was Abraham? How blessed was Abraham? The Bible says he was the richest in the east. He was one of the most wealthy men that lived. Genesis 18, 23, 24. Let's see what he was like. What made him rich? What caused his wealth? What brought him to the top? When given an opportunity to rescue and to deliver. Here we go. And Abraham drew near. Genesis 18. Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure, there be fifty he began, to dis he began to debate with God to try and rescue the lost. Amen. Amen. God blessed him. He became the friend of God. Why was he God's friend? If you want to be God's friend, if you want to be classified at that level, why was he God's friend? Because he cared for what God cared for. He tried to rescue the lost.
His compassion toward the lost. His passion toward the lost. Church, we've got to stop being so selfish. We've got to stop thinking about what can church benefit me? And start thinking, how can I benefit the church? I'm not talking about family worship center. I'm talking about the church. I'm talking about God's house. The kingdom of God. You've got to change your focus and start looking at how you can become a feeder to the kingdom of God. Ripping people out of hell. Don't miss a moment to tell somebody about Jesus. I'm not talking about browbeating people or being foolish about it. But I'm meaning a life that is leading toward people coming to Christ. He began to negotiate the rescue and redemption of people. That's how he became the friend of God. If you love God, then you love what God loves. And and you'll become what God wants you to become. Every true lover of souls has proof of his love for God. Every true lover of God has proofs of his love for God. 1 Corinthians 2.9. But eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of a man the things God has prepared for those that love him. And if you love God, what will you love? This real quiet side over here. If you love God, what will you love? If you love God, what will you love? Souls. His people. Souls. You see, if you want eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has in store for those that Let me put it this way. For those that love what God loves. There'll be proofs. See, I mean, we don't want to go there anymore. We don't want to have any proofs in our life of of, of God in our life. We want to just have uh, this. uh, Anyway, I've got to finish. But there'll be proofs. Souls will be birthed by your life. You'll birth souls. Amen. Amen. I want to quit here. Amen. We're going to go on tonight and probably next week on, on the kingdom benefits and the kingdom stewardship. But I'm asking you this morning, the greatest netted benefit of the believer comes by winning souls. Let me say it to this crowd. The greatest netted benefit comes by winning souls. The greatest, our church will not be able to hold the people We will not be able to contain the blessings. That's you and me in this building, in this church of of God. We won't be able to contain all that God wants to pour into us. God will make us giants when we put his priorities at the level of our, put our priorities as his priorities. When I love souls and I win souls the way God wants me to, then my life will become a star. God will lift me up. He will elevate me. He will bring me to higher heights and greater levels. If you want all God has for you, then you must become a soul winner. Everybody bow your head.